The scripture text this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, The passage is 1 through 14. I will be reading verses 11 through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Morning, Water Dam. Good to be with all of you. Um, we got some uh, good news. I just want to make sure I get it said that uh, congratulations to great grandparents, Carl and Vivian Anderson, on their great granddaughter being born, Maria Lynn Zavallo. And she was born this past week, so we we're thankful for her. And uh, she's like five pounds, right? 15, five, five pounds, 15 uh, inches long. So they're her, that's their little tater, as they said. And so we're thankful for, for all children being born. If you would, please remember uh, Gracie in your prayers um, that uh, it's the Patton's granddaughter. Um, so please pray for her. She has uh, been diagnosed with neuroblastoma. The pediatrician caught it and so uh, found an abnormality. And so they're thankful for that. But now they have to deal with uh, the, the news. So it's, it's a blessing to have the uh, ability to help and the doctor should be able to heal. So we pray for healing for the baby. Um, let's pray before we get started here. Father, we thank you for our time today, that you are our God, that we can take refuge in, that we can trust and we can look to now as we think about you thinking about us, that uh, who is man that you are mindful of us. You are mindful of us and that you're telling us in your word today that you are. So we thank you, Lord, for that picture. As we think about um, our lives, as uh, we pray for those that we've mentioned that are sick, we lift them up. We pray for complete healing for Gracie and for others that have been in and out of the hospital. We do pray for Carol Davis. Uh, She'll finally get back to rehab, and uh, they'll get her back to to normal movement. And we thank you for that the antibiotics are working on the infection. We do lift up Frank as he adjusts to his new home, and we just pray for him. We want to do pray for uh, all those that have been struggling uh, for sickness and uh, just lift them up to you for healing. We do pray for today as we come to you now, Lord, we think about being in uncomfortable places and difficult circumstances that uh, the people of God have been placed there, but they're placed there by you for a purpose and that your purpose is for preparation and to uh, carry out your judgment against them. But in the end, they are given hope with this word from Jeremiah. We pray, Lord, that we would have that same hope that we look to you and that we would be in Christ, and that as we live maybe in uncomfortable circumstances and difficult places, that we would be um, fruitful and faithful as we think about what we are called to do to love you supremely and others sacrificially. As we do that, Lord, let us be thankful today as we recall your works, your mighty works, that you are a God of refuge that your name is something to behold and to be, to be spoke, that your faithfulness is beyond measure. It's vast. And so we thank you for your faithfulness today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we look, look at this passage, uh, I want to say uh, thank you to uh, Dan Fennell uh, for filling the pulpit. He did a great job. He uh, spoke about hell and demon possession while I was gone. And he, and he left it to me to talk to you about today, which is I'm going to try to get you back to heaven, right? Um, but I do appreciate Dan. He did a great job, and it was nice to be able to just uh, relax and listen and be fed. And uh, Dan did a wonderful job. This week, we are going to talk about how we live down here uh, to love God supremely and others sacrificially in the midst of circumstances maybe that we are dealing with that are not comfortable Um, My title is Back to the Future, and it might bring back memories for some of you who grew up in the 80s because you immediately flipped to Marty McFly, right? (laughs) 
And if you grew up in the 80s, you loved that movie. You a 17-year-old high school student gets lost in, back in 1955. Isn't that common for us to think about going back when it would be better in the good old days, right? If we just get back to the good old days. But he ended up there, back there by accident. And uh, McFly is accidentally sent 30 years past time. And it takes uh, Dr. Emmett Brown and his DeLorean with the flux capacitor. I don't know how many of you remember. How many gigawatts or gigawatts did you need? Does anybody remember the number? 88. Okay, good. 88. Okay, somebody really knows that. And so it, it becomes a battle against the clock. But today, my title is intending to take you back to where God talked about the future for the people of God. Back to a time 2,500 years in the past. That's an amazing statement. The Bible makes it clear that becoming a Christian does not insulate you from failure or difficult circumstances. Today we're looking at how God's people found hope when they are exiled into Babylon. We're going to go back when God promises the people a future and a hope. Now, many of you have probably put this verse on your Facebook page or you've stuck it up on a mirror that, to know that, that God has a plan for you. Um, and so when we think about that, it gives a lot of hope. But I want you to understand the context of which what God said that in as we think about that. Uh, the people um, in this letter, the prophet Jeremiah has written in chapter 29, is written shortly after 597 B.C., after the the deportment of many countrymen, he wrote to comfort the people who have been led away into exile. God's soothing promises are delivered to Israel when they are under God's judgment. And Jeremiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom in the Old Testament, right before Judah ultimately fell to Babylon, and he kept telling them that there is a vast army coming. He gave them a warning, a warning they refused to heed. And in Jeremiah's call, in chapter 1, verse 16, we see the charges of what God had against the people is that uh, he would speak through Jeremiah. He says, I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil and forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods and worshiped the works of their hands. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, he breaks down the sins into two evils. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, he says the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Basically meaning that they're relying on their own wisdom to get by, that they think they have a better way. And after several years of preaching, they don't like hearing Jeremiah talk. He's known as the weeping prophet for a reason. Um, He's forbidden to marry. He's whipped. He's put into stocks. He's attacked by a mob and his life was threatened by a king because they didn't like what he was saying. They liked what the other prophets were saying. The other prophets were saying, "Ah, don't worry about it, peace, peace, peace. And he says, there ain't going to be no peace. God's got a problem with you. And it turns out that Jeremiah is right. So the people end up being put into an experience that they'll never forget. And that experience is going to last for 70 years they find themselves in a very uncomfortable place. These are the words it says in chapter 29, verse 1. So to catch the context, we need to understand it. Let's look at verse 1. These are the words of the letter to Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar has taken into exile from Jerusalem to to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs and the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. So how many of you have ever been uprooted from where you lived? How many of you have ever moved in your lifetime? Moved from a country, from a city, or from a place that you grew up in that was very familiar with you, to you? We know what that feels like. And, and I remember moving from Ohio to Pittsburgh um, to, to be with people who don't share my values, that, that they don't like the Cleveland Browns or the Cincinnati Bengals or the, 
the, what other teams do we have? Do we have any other teams in, in Ohio? And, and they like these people called the Steelers, the black and gold. The colors changed and everything. But you've been uprooted, and you know you've been uprooted when you see all of that. And that you move, you, you're moved when you move into a city and you've been used to the country, you move into cramped places, places where the quarters are not so big. You have to get used to it. And so these people felt like they'd been uprooted from their center of life. Their relationship with God was threatened. All of life revolved around the temple to a place they don't want to be in. They've been moved. They've been uprooted. They've been forced to move. Now, some of us have been forced to move by jobs and different situations in life. But imagine being um, a, an army taking off some of your people. Imagine them. They don't want to be there, and they don't want to go there in this place. So as we think about that promise of a future and a hope, let us understand the context of what that was said in. Look at verse 3. We even know who delivered this letter, Elisha. Elisha. Elasa, Elisa. How about that? Let's go with Elisa. How many of us even know our mailman's name? Well, here, this letter was sent, it says in verse 3 there, by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah, Gamaria. Let's do that. The son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The book of Jeremiah is about people's lives being up upended, that their plans were changed. The verse comes in the context of a shocking message <clears throat> that the, the prophet has given from God. They left behind Jerusalem. They anchor, their lives were anchored around the temple and the throne and they assume their relative fortune is a sign that God is for them, the people that stayed in Jerusalem. But those who were carted off in captivity in Babylon are seen to be under God's curse. In other words, there was a group of people that thought Egypt was their, their safety net and that if they stayed in Jerusalem, they'd be okay. And that they were, after all, those people that are going to Babylon are under God's curse. But that's not what God said. Through Jeremiah, he told them that the people, if you go, I'm going to send you there. Look at verse 4. It says, why are the people in this uncomfortable place? The shocking is, answer is that God sent them there into that uncomfortable place that they find themselves in. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The nation of Israel had been taken to the, by the Babylonians into captivity. Their temple, as well as their entire city of Jerusalem, was in ruins. Their king was in chains with his eyes gorged out. The glory of Israel as a nation was finished. But in the midst of that terrible situation, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. Israel now is a Babylonian, in Babylonian slavery because they listened to the prophets who tickled their ears. And when we say this verse and we quote this verse, we often have a different picture than that, don't we? We think of the, the beauty uh, with a nice background, if we can put it on Facebook, that God has a future and a plan for us. I, I know the plans he has for us. But, but, and we say that this, these things happen from time to time. Bad things happen. Uncomfortable situations come about because, after all, the devil wins some of the problems, the devil wins some of the arguments, and then that God is victorious in the other. They surmise all kinds of things like this in the Bible, and nothing can be further from the truth in these circumstances. God was in charge. God raised up Babylon in order to bring his people into a situation whereby they would be so aware and bereft of the security. This is Alistair Begg, that they would be so bereft of the security and the faithfulness of God that in their expression of repentance, they would cry out to him all over again. The sorrow that has been brought upon them, the desolation that they now experience has been inflicted upon them by the God of Israel in the day of the Lord and his fierce anger. Now, where do you get that from? Well, if you want, you can turn with me in the book of Lamentations, which is the very next book. We all know what a lament is. He says 
there in Lamentations 1 of what's going on. This is Jeremiah describing the feeling of it. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She who was great among the nation, she who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly at night, talking about the city, with tears on her cheek among all of her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. She suffers bitterly. It says the road to Zion mourn for the road to Zion mourn for none can come to the festival. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her virgins have been afflicted and she herself suffers bitterly. As we think about this and we think about what God is doing, it says there that God is the one that is behind this exile. God is the one behind this uncomfortable place that they have been sent to. But it is God who will take them through that uncomfortable place. So we have to be careful. The sorrow that has been brought upon them, the desolation that they now experience has been inflicted by them on by the Lord God, by his anger. And so the sorrow that they feel right now is caused by the Lord. Now, right now, some of you are dismissing this as the Old Testament God. You're saying in your mind, some of us have a tendency to say, well, that's the God of the, uh, the Old Testament. The God of the New Testament is full of grace and mercy. No, the God of the Old Testament is full of grace and mercy too. But it is truth. You're making up the parts that you don't like. You're, you're saying, I don't believe that. So that's why many people don't like this. You will often hear people say, the God I believe in is not like that. The God I believe in is loving. And as if you take the Bible and you move them off to the side, the parts that you don't like, you believe yourself. You reject the God of the Bible. You take the parts of the Bible you don't like and you set them off to the side like a plate, like filled with vegetables, like children who do not want to eat their vegetables. So you set those parts apart, those parts aside. I used to do that. I used to do that with the Bible. The parts that I didn't like, I'd move them off to the side of my plate. I don't like that. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to hear that. But that's what happens here. It's a wrong notion to think, this is big, that Christians are always the victorious ones, that they're always on top, in other words, that they're always getting around the trouble and never getting into trouble. But here we see that they're facing many trials and troubles and tribulation. Life after you become a Christian is not always easier. Matter of fact, it might get more difficult. As we think about this, what is going on here? Well, they have found that if they take, the Babylonians have found that if they take 10,000 people and they bring the people that are the priests and the prophets and the officials of Judah and the royals and the craftsmen and the metal workers... On the way out, loot the temple. They believe it will be much easier to get the people of God to assimilate into the culture. Hey, you remember some people like that. Daniel, remember? They changed Daniel's name. Remember his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They changed their names. They took them away from their, their places where they lived. And so they believe that if they take them out of these places that they'll stop resisting the Babylonian empire and assimilate into the culture. They'll become like one of us. They'll change their culture. They'll change their names. They'll, re they'll re-educate to assimilate. They will change their diets and their loyalties and their cultural norms. You remember, that's what they did in the book of Daniel. And what, what I'm pointing out here is that the king takes their property, the people, and the uncomfortable puts them in an uncomfortable situation and they want their beliefs to be no longer held in the majority, so they make them feel a sense of isolation because of their beliefs. Does anyone feel like that sometimes when we're in this world today? That's exactly what happens. Now, a pagan society will challenge our beliefs and wants to conform our values. 
We see it going on right now. The people didn't move in right away. In Psalm 137, verses 1 through 3, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, he said. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy, they said. Sing unto us one of the songs of Zion. Who can sing at a time like this? These people are downtrodden. They're feeling a sense of hopelessness. They're in a very uncomfortable place. We learn in chapter 24 that God sent them into this pagan land. The people that went into Babylon were actually not cursed. They are actually protected. That God says, you will be, I'm doing this for your own good, he says in chapter 24. He says, I will set my eyes on them for good and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord and they shall be my people. Remember those words? Those come back, those harken back to Moses in the Exodus into the wilderness. And I will be their God and they shall return to me with their whole heart. So that's the problem. They have a divided heart and God doesn't like that. They have forsaken him. They've made idols with their own hands that they're worshiping. Then the other people that God talks about is that the people that are left in Jerusalem, it says they will face further hardship, further scattering to other countries, violent deaths and famine and destruction. So God did some of this for the people's good, that the people that went to Babylon were actually, God was doing that for their own good. He says, I'll protect you there. But some that thought they were okay and doing the right things and stayed back, didn't listen to the prophet of God. God says, you shall be utterly destroyed from the land I gave to them and their fathers. That's in chapter 24. So they're very in a very uncomfortable place. Two things happen. A pagan society challenges you and wants to conform your values customs and culture, so they want to change the way you think and they appeal to your appetites. Secondly, a pagan society wants you to re-educate people to assimilate you. So how does God's people deal with this? What does God tell them to do to find hope in the midst of failure and difficult circumstances? Three things, be fruitful, be faithful, be thankful. Be fruitful, be faithful, be thankful. Let's take this first one here, be fruitful. What is the shocking thing that is said to them is found in verse 5, be fruitful. God is saying, I want you to live and settle there. I want you to move into the city. Build houses, he says in verse 5, live in, the, and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Well, if you're going to build a house and you're going to live there and you're going to plant a garden, you must be planning to be there for a while. Right? This is answering the question of how long, oh Lord, are we going to have to be in this uncomfortable place? He says, no, you take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Now that's an interesting statement because what do people say to you? How can you bring up children in this world? How can you bring up children? in this world today. What does God tell him to do? No, I want you, I'm going to put you in the city. I want you to live there. I want you to settle in. These people are still under judgment, but they're also under God's protection. They are still faced with the the idea that you're going to have to get up and go to work with people who don't share your values. When I first moved to Pittsburgh, one of my daughters brought back a terrible towel from kindergarten, believe it or not. And my father-in-law looked at that, and he goes, what in the world is that? They didn't share our values, of course. And so what this is happening is Tim Keller talks about this in this way. He says, while you're on your way to work going to see things that are part of an urban, religious, pluralistic society, there's things that are going to chafe against you. you. But he says, make this city your home. 
And yet the city is not your ultimate home. Remember that too. Make the city your home, live there, build houses, live in them, settle in for the long haul, plant gardens and eat the produce. Take wives, give your daughters in marriage, multiply there. Don't decrease. God wants the Jewish people to live in Babylon. And I want you to know something, that we're all like this. We're all, as Christians, we are called exiles. That's what the Bible uses, the term, that we're aliens or sojourners. And, and we are to, to live in the world but not become of the world. We're to leave our homes. And he said, go into those cramped quarters and live there. Make your home there. And God wants the Jewish people to live there. Some people ask these questions. What do you mean? How can I be fruitful in a place like this? Well, God says, I can make that happen. Why would people have such children in a dark time, in a dark place? My friend, God wants us to shine the light. He wants more light bulbs in the dark place. The world needs more light, not less. Be fruitful, he says, and multiply. Jeremiah 29 says, 7 says, but seek the welfare of the city that I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, you will find welfare. Those are shocking words. Be fruitful. So be faithful as well. Live as resident aliens. Seek the welfare of the city. They have been praying over the city of Jerusalem. They have been praying for peace and refuge in Jerusalem, that the, there would be unity and, and all these things. Now they're in this pagan world. You're to be ambassadors, the Bible says. Seek the welfare of the city. That's what an ambassador does, right? Where do they live? Do they live in their home country? No, they live in a different country. They appreciate the country. Keller says they, they try to learn the language of the country. And they be able, then they try to learn it so that they can... They can um, talk the language, the lingua franca. Is that how they say that? The, the local language. Go Steelers. Right? I mean, seriously, if you think that you're going to, when you walk into the stadium at the Steeler game, that, I was told by Jerry Satano and Kirchner, wear black and gold. Don't wear anything else. Man, that was a new revelation to me. My dad came over here. He says, how do you guys live up on top of these hills and stuff? He goes, it's just up and down, up and down everywhere. How do people build houses? What do we do? We cramp in. We're, we're closer together in these hills, right? We're in the city. We're near the city in cramped quarters. And we, we live as Christians and as ambassadors, as aliens, as sojourners, beside people who don't share our values. But we're supposed to appreciate the city. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek the flourishing of the city. They may operate at a different values, Christian values. You put others first, right? But what's the values of the world? You treat yourself first. It's me first. You don't have to teach your kids how to say that. You don't have to say, learn how to say me first, right? No, they know that right off the bat. You got to teach them to say, your sister can go first. We have to tell Mabel, let your sister go. Little Jojo. They have a thing called the bee. And if little Jojo's on the bee... Mabel wants the bee back, right? You don't have to teach kids that. That's the way we are. But it's built into our DNA. That's a sin nature to put ourselves first. But God wants us to put others first. See, that's the Christian way. We put others first. We give ourselves to others. How are you going to do that? You're going to, go, you're going to have to pray. Who do we pray for? We pray for the Lord. We pray for the city on its behalf. Isn't that amazing? This is a pagan nation. And God is telling them to pray for the city that's pagan. This is how you're going to do it. You may be persecuted at times when you don't share the values of a city. You'll be persecuted. They're supposed to pray for the welfare of the city. Pray for peace of Jerusalem. Verse 6. 
in Psalm 122. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brother's companion's sake, I will say, peace be with you. So in other words, the community, you're praying for the community as well. These people have been used to praying for the, for the community that they lived in in Jerusalem. Now they're in a different community. In smaller quarters, living amongst people who don't share their values. So they're going to have to pray hard. Pray for the sake of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek your good. God says, I will seek your good. Christians are supposed to carry heaven's values. Citizens of heaven, Philippians says. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.11, we are sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against our soul. So we're, we're to be living in the world but not of the world. We are to learn to discern. Why do I say that? Look at verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. He sent Jeremiah. And people pushed that aside. They pushed it off their plate. So sometimes we have to remember that it's going to take us to be able to live amongst people, to live in cramped quarters, to, to get out of our comfort zone, that we're going to have to pray through that. We're going to have to be, we, we're not to stop living, we're to, to live there, to make our home there, to be fruitful, but we're also to be faithful to the Lord. Learn to discern. When people are under stress, when are, they, when are they most likely to give in or listen to teaching that makes them feel good or tells them an easier way when they're under stress? So you have to learn to discern. The last thing is be thankful. Look what it says in verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Now, we think about that. That's right before verse 11, which we like to put on our, our, our Facebook pages or we like to put it on our, our uh, mirrors in the, or our car or wherever. Um, that God has a plan for your life, a wonderful plan for your life. Well, this is the plan, baby. Buckle up, buttercup, because 70 years is a generation. So many of the people that received this promise will not live to see its fulfillment. Only if you were young enough or you uh, lived long enough would you see this promise. But what it is is saying that God is faithful. I can rely on God even in the midst of an uncomfortable place and an uncomfortable circumstance. If I've been uprooted or I ever feel like I've been uprooted, a place I don't want to be, to experience things I don't want to experience. What are you doing, God? Why do I have this illness? What are you doing, God? Why did my father have to die? Well, we all have to die. And we die because of sin. It doesn't mean we like it. That doesn't mean that that God's presence, that these people didn't experience that stuff while they were living there. He said, go build houses, plant gardens, enjoy your family, pray for the community, seek the welfare of the city. But you know what? It still wasn't easy. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that it's not going to be forever, that I do have a plan for you. That's why these words are comfortable. God has a plan for them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, meaning shalom. Now, that word shalom means just more than just peace. It means wholeness, harmony. It means fulfillment. It means unimpaired relationships with others and with God. He says, I have plans for your welfare, not for evil. Don't be thinking that. Just how many times do we think God's against us when we're going through bad stuff and we're in uncomfortable circumstances, when we've been uprooted out of our comfort zone? We think immediately, well, God must be upset with me. Don't think that. God says, don't think that way. You're going to have to fly by the instruments of the plane. What does that mean? What do pilots have to do when they're flying? They have to look at the instruments and trust the instruments. Instruments. If you're going to go very far and you start feeling like you're, you can't see anything, either you're in the fog or you're in darkness, what do you want that pilot to do? You want to go by his feelings or you want to trust the instruments? 
You want him to trust the instruments, trust me. And so what I mean by that is that they're going to have to trust the songs they are singing. You're going to have to look back on God's faithfulness in the past and be thankful in gratitude. Isn't that what we sing? Great is thy faithfulness. What are we talking about? God's past works, his faithfulness, his vast faithfulness, his mercies are new every morning. That comes, that's comes out of lamentations, out of the suffering of the people. And so they're going to have to look back in God's faithfulness in the past and be thankful, be grat- have gratitude. They're going to have to look forward in faith and trust that God has a future and a hope for them. Trust God has not forgotten you. He wants to give you a future. That word for that welfare and then to give you a future and a hope, that word for hope is actually the literal meaning is a cord. So God gives you a rope of hope. I like that. A rope of hope. Something you can grab onto. Something that you can look to for the future. Not a hope that says, I hope it doesn't snow today, but a hope, an expectation of a certain outcome, an expected end. We have been uprooted, maybe. We found ourselves feeling separated. The wheels have fallen off. We may be tempted to feel like God has abandoned us. But God says, I'm only a prayer away. Look at verse 12. Then you will call upon me, and you'll be able to pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me, and I will, you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations that all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. We are called to be the people of God, to love God supremely and love others sacrificially. Even in most, the most uncomfortable circumstances, we find ourselves. How do we do that? We look at Jesus. Keller talks about this. Jesus moved into our world, a much smaller place, trust him, into cramped quarters. Jesus incarnated himself. He, he became a, a man. He was born as, uh, from a virgin's womb. He became a baby, helpless, and, and sitting there being fed by Mary. Jesus Christ moved into our world into much smaller quarters than he was used to, and he incarnated himself. He moved into our neighborhood. He, pers- he was persecuted because he didn't share our values, because he had the kingdom's values. And he died for his enemies. He died for people that were his enemies. He died so that we might live for him. Only if you understand that he died in your place, Romans 5, 8, that God shows us his love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Only if we live in this way will we cause people to ask us, how can you live like? Because Jesus did. And Jesus wants us to be faithful, to be fruitful, and to be thankful. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you now, we are so thankful that you have a plan for us. In the light of your context of this passage, that you declare, Lord, that you're thinking about us, that you have not abandoned us, that we can trust your hand, that you have the future, that you want a plan for us for our welfare and not for evil, to give us a future and a hope. So, Father God, I pray that for those that are here today that have not put their trust in you, that they would consider Christ. The day that they would maybe be confronted, maybe, by you, God, that you sent your son into this world, and he lived here. He moved into our world. He moved into our neighborhood, and he wants to come inside of you, friend, and live inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
that he will give you his righteousness and he will take your unrighteousness. That he died in your place. He died so that you might live. Father God, we pray as we think about our future, that our future is hopeful in Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I couldn't get the clapping down there. I'm going to have to work on that. <laughs> Hear the words of the benediction in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.